Well, good morning, one and all. Welcome to CEFC. I'd like to invite everyone here at Carlisle to stand up. And if you're joining us at home, we are so glad that you are here as well. We're going to start off this morning by, let's read a, a passage from Psalm 100 together. So let's read this, would you, with me? Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord uh, with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. And we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning that you are faithful. Lord, we thank you this morning that you have provided everything that we need. So, Lord, we depend on you, Lord, as our strength, as our shield. Lord, we depend on you for our salvation. Lord, we ask that you now would restore us joy. Lord, that you would give us thankful hearts, that as we sing these songs, as we listen to your word, we would not just go through the motions, Lord, but this morning you would stir in us. And, Lord, would you help us to worship you with our whole heart. And all of God's people said, amen. Come on now.
I search the world But it couldn't fill me But man's empty praise The treasures that fade Are never enough That you came along And put me back together Fire here in your love. Come on, that's your story. Sing out. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Show you 
you pray with me, Lord? There is nothing, there is nothing better than you. Lord, we have searched the whole world over. Lord, we have found disappointment after disappointment after disappointment in this world. So, Lord, in this moment, we pray that you would allow us, Lord, that you would give us the strength, the courage. Lord, give us the gift of humility to remember there is nothing greater than you. There's nothing we need apart from you. You are our strength. Lord, you are our shield. You are everything that is good in us, Lord. The only good we have is from you. So, Lord, as your people, Lord, together in one voice, we say we love you. Lord, as your children, we say thank you. Lord, thank you for loving us the way you do. Thank you for saving us the way you did. Lord, we delight in you. We reverence you, Lord. We ask that you would move in our hearts this morning as we sing, as we listen, Lord. Just, Father, would you help us not to leave this morning unchanged? Lord, help us to be more like you. Lord, to remember all that you are and all that you have done in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Man, it's so good to worship you this morning. Would you take a minute to welcome a few folks around you before you have a seat? Good morning. I want to welcome you here. We're super glad that you're here to worship with us. And my prayer and my hope is that this will be a time that we connect with Christ, that we grow in our relationship with him. And so as we continue to, to prepare and to engage in worship, let me just tell you about a few things happening in the church. The first is that we have a sportsman's feast coming up. And you might be wondering, well, what is that? And that is an opportunity for you to invite people to come to church on a Friday or Saturday night who might not ever come on a Sunday morning. Um, but with the allure of winning a prize uh, or of uh, uh, hearing about hunting or fishing. And so I have a friend I invited to come. Um, he's come the last couple of years, and he, he does not come to church, um, probably not interested in coming to church, but he was willing to come because he was hoping to win a prize. And um, do you know what prize he won? Nothing. He has not won ever. Um, but he continues to come back because uh, it's a great night, and there's really just, I think, outstanding people. There's great food. And there's a good message about Jesus. And so I want to encourage you to think about inviting somebody who probably won't win a prize, but who may come to know Jesus, and that would be awesome. Uh, second thing I want to tell you about is um, in the lobby, there's an opportunity to fill out um, cards for healthcare workers in our area. And as you know, um, this has been a very difficult time for healthcare workers, and it's our desire to encourage and to build people up. And so maybe you would write on a card of encouragement or a prayer, and then we will take those cards along with a care basket and deliver them to um, various hospitals in the area. So that's something that you can do right after the service in the lobby. You can also find out about more opportunities to get involved in serving in our community. Um, I want to pray for our service before we take up an offering, but let me just remind you of one thing, and that is if you've got children in the room with you, that's great because we love kids. If your child is not loving the service, um, down the hall, there are quiet rooms on both sides of the hall, and you can take your child there um, if you need to during the service and, and take in the service there, which would be fantastic. Um, but what we're going to do here now is, is pray, and I want to ask you if you'll pray with me. So let's, let's come before our Father. Father, we come to you and we acknowledge that you have all might and all power. We thank you for sending Christ to give his life. Christ, who you raised up from the dead, that we might have hope in this life and for all of eternity. And so, Father, I pray for those who are struggling with hope right now. Lord, I pray for those who are up against sickness. I pray for those, Father, who are struggling with the, the hardships and disappointments of life. And I pray, Father, for those who are in relationships that are, are really difficult. And I ask that you would give hope. Not hope that things would just get easier and better, but hope that, that can be found in Jesus. A hope that there's meaning and purpose. A hope, Father, that, that even through hardship and difficulty, that you can cause holiness and even bring joy. And Father, we want to pray not only for ourselves, but for the world that we live in. And so we pray for the situation in Ukraine. We ask, Father, that you would bring peace. And we ask, Lord, that wherever we see violence or the threat of violence, whether it's around the world or even in our own neighborhoods, that it would remind us of the sanctity of life and also the brevity of life. And then, Father, thinking about how short life is, may we live for the things that are eternal. May we cast off, Lord, the sin that easily entangles us. May we turn away from the, the physical things of this world, the entrapments of this world, and may we find our hope, our strength, and our truth in Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for your growth, for spiritual growth to take place in us. We pray that we would grow in such a way that we would reflect you in our community and in our homes, and that you would be honored and glorified. Now, Lord, would you continue to do that great work which only you can accomplish, that work of sanctification. We ask that you would do that work in us right now. In the name and the power of Jesus Christ, amen.
the sins of the world His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Every knee will bow before Him So open up the gates Make way before the King of Kings The God who comes to save Is here to set the captives free Who can stop the Lord Almighty Our God is the Lion The Lion of Judah He's roaring with power And fighting our battle While you're taking your seat, uh, I'll just explain that uh, last night I was talking with my wife and she said, have you talked with Eric so that you're not wearing the exact same clothes? <laughs> and I said, I said, that'll never happen. And she said, you should talk to him. And I clearly did not. And so it's my pleasure to introduce my good friend, um, Eric Bonkowski, who's the senior pastor at um, City Church in Richmond. But Eric and I met almost 24 years ago. We were both uh, first year students at seminary. And I had no friends, which I know is hard to imagine, but it's true. Zero friends. And looking out over the other classmates, I thought maybe I didn't want to have any friends until I met Eric, who was sarcastic and who was funny. And we attended classes together. We skipped classes together. Uh, we prayed together. We debated scripture together, discussed scripture. And then um, after we finished seminary, we both moved to different states. But we've continued to get together um, several times a year because of the friendship which God gave us and because of his incredible encouragement as a brother in the Lord. And so I'm excited to introduce Eric to you and to have him encourage you the way that he's encouraged me. And so would you just join me in welcoming Eric Bonkowski? Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here with you this morning. And you know, have you ever had one of those mornings where everything's going wrong, right? You wear the wrong clothes, so you look like that clown over there. 
And, uh, the, the, you know, the other thing that, that Chad has told me before, uh, I've spoken here before, and he's like, uh, we, we do a live stream, there are cameras, so don't wear a light-colored shirt. So I'm the bozo wearing the light-colored shirt, probably, you know, washed out for those of you watching at home. That's okay. Uh, because maybe you had a morning like that, too. And when you come to church, when you come to this church, it doesn't matter how your morning was, because we've got good news. And I'm going to share some of that good news with you today about Jesus. Uh, You know, not only do we wear the same clothes, but when we think about talking to you all, we think about the same things. And I want to start by telling you a little bit about life 24 years ago when Shad and I first met at seminary in Philadelphia. And as he said, um, most of our friendship was born from skipping class and going out to coffee at Daryl's Donuts, which no longer exists. But we would go to Daryl's Donuts and we would talk about all the things that you talk about when you're having coffee, you know, uh, relationships and sports. And so so we would talk about my love life or lack thereof. Uh, We would talk about Shad's jump shot or lack thereof. And uh, because we were seminary students, we also, we, we talked about church. We talked about church because every young man in seminary is sure that he knows what's wrong with the church, and the church that he's going to pastor one day will have none of those problems. And seldom do those young men in seminary let the Bible get in the way of any of their theories. (laughs) But the, the reason I share that is because today I want you to think about the nature of the church. What is the church? If I ask you that question, what is the church? How would you answer it? And I, and I want you to try to be honest with yourself. Don't, don't give the answer that you would give to shatter me, that you would give to a pastor. What's your real answer? What's the functional answer? You know, over the last couple of years, as I've thought about the church, especially through COVID and all the disruptions that it's brought to our lives, I've realized that a lot of us, when we think about the church, we think in terms of some secular analogs. Some other things in the culture, in society, that inform the way that we think about the church more than the Bible informs the way we think about the church. Let me give you an example. A couple of examples would be that we use the secular analogs of like the gym or a store to think about the church. And the, the problem with these analogs is that a lot of them are highly individual, highly voluntary, and highly transactional. And that is not how the Bible talks about the church of God and God's people. Let me give you an example. The gym. Have you ever, uh, maybe maybe this is something you've said before, you've heard someone say this before. They say, uh, you know, I want to get back going to the gym, but before I start going to the gym again, I need to get myself in shape. So I'm not embarrassed when I get to the gym, right? You ever said that or has that thought gone through your mind? We do the same thing with the church, don't we? I really should get back going to the church, but I better get my life in order before I do. That's a functional way that we define the church. Let me give you uh, another example. Uh, Another example would be more around a store. Some of us shop at certain stores or don't shop at other stores because we feel like they don't align with our personal brand for whatever reason. Now, we can take that same approach and apply it to the church as well and say, does this church validate my truth? Again, that is not how the Bible talks about the church. And so what I want to do with you this morning is to look at uh, one metaphor, one primary metaphor that the Bible uses to talk about the church. And, and this, is the, this is the usual way that the Bible talks about the church. It uses a bunch of different metaphors. We don't have time, I wish we did, this morning to talk about all of these metaphors, but I want to talk with you about one. And this particular metaphor comes from the book of 1 Timothy where Paul is writing instructions to his young protege in the faith, who effectively is a a pastor, a church planter. And he writes to Timothy in chapter 3. And I'm going to read just verses 4 through 16 for you. This is God's word. Let's give it our attention this morning. Here's what Paul writes to his son in the faith. He says this, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that If I delay, you may know how one ought to behave, and here come the metaphors, in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. 
He, it's talking about Jesus here, he was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Father, we know your spirit's in this place, and we ask that your spirit would continue to work in us and through your scripture to bring us sight of Jesus, our Savior. We ask now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your name, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I want to talk about the church and a specific metaphor for the church, and if you're playing paying close attention as I read these verses, you realize that verse 15 is actually a three for one deal. There are three metaphors uh, for the church in this passage. First, it says a household of God. That's essentially saying that the church is a family of God. Then it says that the church is, uh, it says, which is the church of the living God? That means it's an assembly. It says assembly where God himself is. And then the third one, a pillar and buttress of the truth. And that last one, that last metaphor is a two for one in and of itself, a pillar and a buttress of truth. And that's what I want to talk with you about today. And when you hear that phrase, maybe even as I read through the scripture a second ago, the thought may have been going through your head, wait a second, is Paul getting things backwards here? He says it's a pillar and a buttress of the truth, but don't we usually think about the church in the opposite direction, that the church rests on the foundation of the, of the truth, not that the truth uh, rests on the foundation of the church. You know, think about what Jesus says in Matthew's gospel. He's saying to, to Peter, he says, you're the rock. Your confession of me is the rock, and on this rock... I will build my church, right? Well, Paul isn't getting it backwards. He's basically saying it's both. It's both. You see, absolutely, the church depends for its existence on the truth. But the truth also depends upon the church for its proclamation and its defense. That's the point of this metaphor, that the, the church exists, its mission in the world, its purpose is to proclaim and to defend the truth of God. Again, I want you to think for a second of those functional definitions of the church that we all walk around with. Does yours include the church as the proclaimer and defender of the truth of the word of God? So let's dig into this metaphor a little bit more and explain it, just so we're all on the same page. First, I want to talk about pillar. That's the first word in this metaphor. The church is a, a pillar of the truth. Well, you probably have an idea of what a pillar is, right? A pillar, you've seen them. They're large columns out in the front of a house or a building. And what do they do? They, they make the front of the building prominent. They hold up the roof. They support the roof. That's what a pillar does. Now, the context of this uh, letter, 1 Timothy. Paul's writing to Timothy, as I've said. And Timothy at the time was in the, the ancient city of Ephesus. And they just put on the screen a picture of the temple of Artemis at Ephesus. And this was one of the, the seven wonders of the ancient world. And you can see why from this picture, right? From this rendering. Do you see how many pillars there are? I think the, the archeologists have counted there are over a hundred of these pillars. Presumed, and they were 60 feet high, each of them. And the, the temple was built on this great foundation, so the temple was visible from the whole city. That's the context, that's the background where Paul writes to Timothy and he says, The church is a pillar of the truth. Carries a little bit more meaning now once we know that, right? So, what does the church do? The church is a pillar that holds the truth of, word, of God's word high. It lifts it up. Without the church, the truth will begin to sink lower and lower in your life. Have you ever, uh, have you ever held something above your head? Right? You lift your arms up and you hold it, and you start out, and for the first 10 seconds, you're like, I could do this forever. And then after about 20 seconds, your arms are tired and it starts sinking lower and lower down and you can barely hold that weight above your head, even if it's not a significant weight. 
The church is the pillar of the truth. It comes along and it holds the truth of God high for us when we are too weak. There's another function that a pillar has architecturally, and this I think is important. What a pillar does is it transfers the weight of the roof, it transfers them structurally down to the foundation below. Well, what is the foundation? We've already talked about this. The foundation is Jesus on which the church is built. And so what the pillar does is it holds this truth high, but it also is pushing the weight down onto Jesus, the only one who can bear the weight of the truth, the only one who can carry it, so that you and I don't have to do it. A pillar is very important. The church is the pillar of the truth. All right, well, let's talk now about this second word, buttress, right? Pillar is more familiar, but it says, Paul says that the church is a pillar and a buttress, of truth. You know, I, I spoke on this at City Church in Richmond, and after the message, uh, a dad came up to me, and he's, a, he's got like an eight, nine-year-old son, and he said, hey, Eric, thanks a lot for using the word buttress like a billion times in the sermon, right? <laughs> My kid kept elbowing me the entire sermon long. It's not that, okay? Get your minds out of the gutter. It's not what a buttress is. It has nothing to do with that. But this next picture, this is a picture of Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. And the architectural feature, those kind of uh, arch-like things that are coming off the side of it are known as flying buttresses. A buttress is a support that bears the weight of the walls, that holds up, that carries the weight of the, the walls. This word that's used here in 1 Timothy 3 is only used once in the New Testament. And it comes from a root word that means steadfast or firm, and it's usually translated as a foundation, a support. That's what a buttress is. A buttress uh, provides support, especially to lateral forces. That is, forces that would cause the walls to fall down. Again, all that weight from the roof has to go somewhere, and you would either need to make the walls incredibly thick or you need to provide support to them, and that's what a buttress does. There are a bunch of examples of this that are a little bit closer to home. You don't have to go to Paris to see them, right? Um, have you ever seen, as you're driving around, uh, a fence that someone's built, and over time, that fence gets really wobbly, and it looks like it's about to fall down? Maybe you have one of these on your property, right? And what do you do? You'll, you'll see someone stick a two-by-four or something up against, at an angle against that fence, so that it doesn't topple over. Or think about an above-ground pool, right? Uh, when it's filled with water, there's an incredible amount of force that the water puts on those walls to push them out. And you can go on YouTube and watch uh, uh, great video clips of above-ground pools collapsing, right? Because the force was too much. And they need to have buttresses every so often around the perimeter to hold them together. The church does that for the truth of God. It keeps the truth held together so it doesn't leak out of your life or of my life. So that the, the forces don't cause it to crumble in our lives. A pillar and a buttress of truth. You see, without the church, the truth will not be lifted high in your life or in my life. Without the church, the truth will begin to leak out the sides of our lives. That's why this metaphor is so important for understanding of the church. All right, there's another important question that comes to mind though when we're talking about the church as a pillar and buttress of the truth. What is the truth that the church holds high and that the church holds firm? Here's why it's an important question. Because there are a lot of wrong answers to this question. And again, I think over the last two years, that we've been tempted to, to think of different truths that the church ought to hold high and hold firm that aren't the real truth of the Word of God. Let me give you some examples. The church is not called to hold a particular political platform firm and high. It's not called to uh, hold firm and high a particular educational approach or a particular parenting strategy. There are a lot of things that the church may speak to, but aren't the core truth that it is called to hold high and hold firm. And the reason I share this is because I think uh, pastors like Shad have been under an enormous amount of pressure over the last two years 
to hold certain truths that the church is not called to hold. Pastors like Shad and myself, we are called to hold high and hold firm the truth of the word of God and not all the other things. And it's become exhausting for us. It's kind of like when your phone is out of range and it's searching for a signal and you know how the battery drains down immediately? That's what it's been like as pressure has been put on the church to pontificate on truths that it is not called to hold firm and hold high. Well, what is that truth? Paul defines it for us. He defines it for us in verse 16. He says the church is a pillar and buttress of truth. The very next verse he says, great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. So let me say a couple words about this mystery of godliness. When, when Paul writes here, great indeed is the mystery of godliness, again, what is in the back of his head is the context in Ephesus. Remember that temple, the temple of Artemis that I showed you? Part of what the people in uh, Ephesus did was they worshipped the goddess Artemis, and they would walk around town, they would walk through the streets, and they would yell out, great is Artemis of Ephesus, great is Artemis of Ephesus. That was their confession. So here in verse 16, he says, Picking up that language, echoing that language, he says, great indeed is the mystery of godliness. Something else is great. Something that has to do with Jesus Christ, not with the goddess Artemis. Now, uh, he uses this word mystery, and I want to say a word about that because it's different from how we normally think of mystery. We think of mystery as something that is completely unknowable. Right? Well, it's a mystery to me. The way that the Bible uses the word mystery is slightly different. It's something that was hidden that now has been revealed. Something hidden that has now been revealed. That's what Paul is talking about. And he's talking specifically about the truth of Jesus Christ. It was hidden for the ages, but now in Christ it is made made visible. This becomes very clear to us in uh, the book of Colossians which uh, Paul also wrote, and I want to read a verse from that, a couple of verses. He says in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 25, he says, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, okay? He's talking about making the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for the ages and generations, but now revealed. Do you see how he defines mystery in these very terms? You used to not know this truth, but now you know it because God has made it known to you. The mystery of godliness. Great indeed is the mystery of godliness, he says in 1 Timothy 3. And he's talking about Jesus Christ. That is the truth that uh, the church is to be the pillar and buttress of. And what he does As we come back to 1 Timothy 3, he says, Great indeed, we confess is the mystery of godliness, and then he gives a confession. That's what the the last verse here. It kind of reads like a creed. Some of you uh, men may be studying the Apostles' Creed. I saw the announcement slide before the service, right? This is a version of an early confession where the church was summarizing, here's what we believe about Jesus. And the church's job is to be a pillar and buttress of this truth about Jesus. He was manifested in the flesh. That means his incarnation. He was vindicated by the Spirit. I know that's weird language. We don't use it a whole lot anymore. That's really talking about the resurrection. Jesus came in the flesh. He rose from the dead. He was seen by angels. What's that talking about? He ascended into heaven. He was proclaimed among the nations. He was believed on the world. He was taken up into glory. These are the basic facts about Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection, his ministry in the church today. That is what the church confesses. That is what the church holds high and holds firm in the midst of everything else that's going on. That alone is the message that the church holds high and holds firm, right? Uh, Think about all these people on the streets of Ephesus. Great is Artemis of Ephesus. And the church comes along, this group of ragtag Christians come along and they have a different confession and they're walking through the streets and they're shouting something else. They are shouting, great is Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Great is his name. And as they walk those streets, they together as the church 
are holding the truth high and holding the truth firm. So let me ask you a question again. What is the confession of your life? Again, not the right answer, not the answer you'd give to a pastor, but the answer of your life functionally. As you're walking around each day, what are you calling out? What are you holding high? What are you holding firm? Why does all of this matter? Why, why does God, through Paul, give us this metaphor of the pillar and the buttress of truth? Well, I think it matters because it co- confronts and corrects our faulty understanding of what the church is. And I think God gives this to it because he knows that we're desperate for a place that will hold the truth of Jesus high and hold it firm. God knows that you're desperate for that. You see, the the church holds high this message of Jesus Christ for every person out there and every person in here who is struggling today, who feels lonely, who feels overwhelmed with their sin and their brokenness, who doesn't have a purpose in life, doesn't know up from down, and the church holds high the message of Jesus so that everyone can see it. All the people who've never seen, who've never heard about Jesus Christ, the church holds that message high. And for those of you who have seen it, uh, it it holds it high again because you need to see it again today. You know how you're driving a long drive, maybe it's night and you're, you're hungry and you need to uh, stop and then you see the golden arches on the highway, right? That's what the church is. It's lifting high what you need, what you're desperate for, the truth, the exclusive truth that says Jesus Christ is the only way. He is the only savior for sinners. He's the only rescue for you out of the mess that you made of your life. And it's holding high this message that we need to hear that it's all of grace. You don't have to clean yourself up before you come here. It's not like the gym where you have to work out to get yourself in shape before you can go to the gym and work out. Come as you are. We need that truth lifted high again and again because functionally we start disbelieving it. We start believing other lies. And the church holds firm the truth of God too. And actually, uh, the, the very next verse in 1 Timothy tells us why. It says uh, in 1 Timothy 4, 1, it says this, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter time some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and to the teaching of demons. Why does the church need to hold firm the truth of God? Well, because of this. Because the world we live in is full of voices carried along by the the work and the power of the devil that would distract and deceive and cause us to depart from faith. I don't know if you all are familiar with the term deconstructing or deconstruction. In my church in Richmond, uh, there are lots of people who say they're in this process of deconstructing their faith. And, and, and the way they talk about it, they, they'll kind of spin it and say, well, I'm going through this intellectual evolution where I'm uh, reconsidering all the things that I learned from the Bible and from God. And, and they pass it off as this enlightened process they're, they're going through. And, and what I have to tell those folks is let me call it for what it is. It's unbelief. You are leaving the truth of God. You are turning from the confession of the mystery of godliness that has been revealed to us in Christ Jesus and you are going after futile tales and fables. They need and we need the church to hold firm the truth that God has revealed to us. The church exists to defend the truth for us and often from us from the places where we would leave, where we are filled with doubt, where we're confused. What I see time and time again in the context of the church is people who come to the church and they begin to measure the church by their own personal belief 
rather than measuring their lives by the truth that the church upholds. You see the difference there? It goes back to that analogy of the store. Do you think of the church as a store? And I'll shop there if they validate my brand. That is not how the church operates. The church lifts high and holds firm the truth about Jesus Christ. And it says to you, where your life is out of accord with this, repent and believe the gospel and live filled with the Spirit the way that God has designed you to live. All right, I realize that the the risk of this message in many ways has been a little bit abstract and theoretical, and maybe you're asking yourself, what what difference does this make in my life? How how would I apply this? Well, I I, want to end by talking about how the church holds the truth of Jesus high and holds it firm, and I think that will give you some application. And so how does the church do this? Very simply, the church does this by telling the truth. The church, as the pillar and buttress of truth, tells the truth. In two primary ways we do that. One is that uh, we do it through preaching and teaching the word of God. So each week, Shad, the other pastors, the staff here, are teaching the truth to you. That is holding high and holding firm the word of God. That is why uh, pastors like Shad and I went to seminary and studied and have been ordained and have been called to this work because it's really important. The truth is very important. It must be held high and must be held firm. And it's why that these messages every Sunday morning ought to be straight out of God's word and not the opinions or the rants of uh, personal rants of the pastor. Right? Some of you maybe have listened to the rise and fall of Mars Hill. And part of the problem there was it became this personal platform instead of lifting high and holding firm the word of God. You know, it's the same reason that people at my church in Richmond, they say, yeah, you know, Eric, you really only have one sermon because it's always about Jesus. And they say that to me and I say, thank you. I do. That's the only message I've got. But I'm going to hold him high and hold him firm until I die. So it's the church that tells you the truth, right? Through its pastors, through its staff, but this is really important. There's another way that we tell the truth, and it's you. You tell the truth to yourself and to one another and in your care groups and in your homes and in your workplaces and in your schools. You tell the truth, and every time you do, you lift high and hold firm the truth about Jesus You know, I was talking to Shad uh, last week a little bit, and I had just been to the dentist, and I said, I hate going to the dentist. And we kind of were talking about that a little bit, and he, you know, he says when he goes to the dentist, sometimes they start asking him about the church, and I said very quickly, I was like, oh, they don't know I'm a pastor at the dentist. And he said to me, he said, well, it's a good thing that you're not talking about evangelism then. (laughs) And I felt conviction at that, right? And rightly so. Because I knew in the back of my head, I am actually talking about evangelism. Because every day of our lives, we're evangelizing for something. Every day of our lives, we are holding high and holding firm some truth. We are saying, great is Artemis of Ephesus. Or we're saying, hey, great is this podcast that I listen to. Or great is my political party. Or great is my sports team. Or most of us, most of the time, are saying in subtle or not so subtle ways, great is me. Great is me. What if we were committed to telling the truth about Jesus and we committed our lives to the message that great is Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords? That's how we tell the truth. We tell the truth primarily with our words. There are lots of places in the Bible where we could go to see this, but I want to read just a verse from Ephesians 4, verse 25. It says this, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbors, for we are members of one another. If I followed you around this week and listened, which admittedly would be a super creepy thing to do, (laughs) if I followed you around this week, what would I hear? 
What truth would I hear you saying? Would I hear you lifting high and holding firm the truth of Jesus Christ or something else? You know, you won't have the energy, you won't have the wherewithal, you won't have the capacity to hold high and hold firm Jesus Christ if you've spent all your time talking about other stuff, politics or sports or celebrities or yourself. You just won't have time for it. The other thing I want to share with you is that this week, as you leave this place, as you think about opportunities to uh, proclaim Jesus with your words, to tell the truth, you will not run into a single person who is saying to themselves, you know what, I have just received too much encouragement today. It doesn't exist. There's a great opportunity there for you to hold high and hold firm the truth of Jesus Christ, the gospel of his grace, his exclusive grace, his sustaining grace. You know, I started out by kidding a little bit about uh, my time in seminary with Shad. At Daryl's Donuts, where we were young men who thought we knew everything about the church. But I'll tell you one thing that did happen as we drank coffee together is that Shad, for me, told the truth. He held Jesus Christ high and he held Jesus Christ firm for me when I needed it. In my strength, there were times where Shad reminded me that the gospel had nothing to do with my strength and my merit, but everything to do with Jesus' grace. He lifted Jesus high, and I got just a little bit lower, right? And there were times in my weakness, in my sin, in my doubt, in my disbelief, where Shad held the truth of Jesus firm for me, reminding me what was true about Jesus and about me in church we have the opportunity to go this week and do the same. I pray that you will. Let me pray. Gracious God in heaven, we thank you that you've given us your word, a word that is centered on your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray now by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would help us believe again the truth of his work for us and that you would send us out to hold high and hold firm this mystery of godliness, once hidden and now revealed, that our Savior has come, that he delights to call us his children, and that he will never, ever leave us or forsake us. We pray this all in his name. Amen. So the worship team is going to come out, and we're going to uh, sing another song here. And I think that's very fitting. Because one of the ways that we tell the truth to each other, one of the ways that the church holds high and holds firm the truth about Jesus Christ is through our singing. Yes, we do it with our words, we do it with our preaching, we do it through conversations. But have you ever gone to church and the sermon hasn't been very good? I mean, not here, of course, <laughs> but somewhere. Uh, but through all that, the music, the worship still spoke truth to your soul. That's what we have an opportunity to participate in now. my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for and now my life is yours and I will sing of your goodness forevermore worthy is your name Jesus, you deserve the praise.
and amazed in your love undeniable your grace goes on and on and I will sing of your goodness forevermore worthy is your name Your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory coming and worshiping Christ together, for lifting him up. I mean, Jesus is the one thing that we have in common. He's the th he is the person who unifies us. He's the one who strengthens us and encourages us. And my prayer is that you leave today being encouraged in the name and the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, before I pray for you, let me just tell you about two things um, next week. Uh, first of all, after the second service next week, we'll have a membership class meeting. And if you're interested in learning about the church, you can come and have a free lunch and ask any question you want about the church, and we would just be delighted to talk with you, and you could learn more about the church that way. And then secondly, um, next week, I'll start a new series called Who Do You Love? And we're going to be examining our hearts through Scripture to see if we're living for the things that really matter. And you can prepare for next week by reading the book of 1 John. And so there's five chapters. You have seven days to read five chapters in 1 John. I'm going to pray for you, and, and then after that, if you would like prayer, um, come forward. We'd be delighted to pray with you, to encourage you, and to ask God to strengthen you. And so let me, let me pray now, and would you join me as we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for the truth of Jesus Christ. We pray that Christ would be lifted up in our lives, that we would be drawn to him, that we'd be strengthened by him, that we would worship and follow him with all of our heart, with all of our strength, and with all of our mind. 
And then, Father, we ask that you would give us the courage and the love for others, that we would speak about Jesus, that others might come to know you as well. May you send us out now in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. May God bless you. Have a great week.